So we're going to continue our study of the Minor Prophets this morning, and we're looking at Nahum today. Probably some of you have Nahum as your favorite book, right? You're real familiar with it, just like I was. Um, we will jump in there just a minute. Let me say a couple of things. First of all, thank you for uh, bearing with me. Last Sunday, the plan was for me to teach, but then kind of at the last minute realized that it was seven up Sunday and so our youngest Charlie was moving up to the youth group and it's kind of important for, for uh, me to be there so um, I appreciate uh, somebody else filling in I, I honestly don't know who it was but um, uh, so that gave me uh, an extra week here so we're in the seventh of the minor prophets out of 12 and uh, Lord willing we're going to cover the whole book of Nahum today all three chapters but before we do that, let's pray. God, we thank you for your love and mercy, and we thank you for uh, your word. God, um, through your Holy Spirit, give us wisdom so that uh, we can understand what we read and that uh, it'll help us better understand you and ourselves and our world. And Father, that it'll help us to become more like Jesus. We pray all this in his name. Amen. So we've been look, using this uh, table of the prophets of Israel. Now I marked out all the non-minor prophets. And um, today we're looking at Nahum. And for the first time, the primary audience of one of these minor prophets is not Israel or Judah, but is Assyria. So it's a foreign country. And we're going to talk a lot about Assyria today. In the book of the Twelve, as the Jewish people refer to it, we are... Um, again at book seven and over and over again we've referenced this map and the fact that at this time the kingdoms uh, the nation of Israel was really cut, uh, cut into two had divided into two nations the northern nation which retained the name Israel and the southern which was Judah so the capital of the northern kingdom is uh, Samaria in the capital, of course, of Judah is Jerusalem. We've also used this timeline throughout our study. Today we're looking at Nahum, and we can date Nahum within a few decades. We're, we're fairly confident of when it was written because of a, a couple of big markers. Now, one is that he's speaking to the uh, Assyrians. And we know that in 612 BC, the Assyrians were overtaken by the Babylonians, the Medo-Babylonian Empire. So uh, it comes before the fall of that. He wouldn't have really needed to say anything about the fall of Assyria if it came after that. And then also there's a reference to the sack of Thebes. We'll talk about that later, which I think happened in 663 BC. So we have a general time frame for the book. So we refer to the Assyrian Empire or the Neo-Assyrian Empire. There are kind of three major time periods when the Assyrians were powerful. And this, uh, during our time period, this is the rough terrain of the uh, um, Assyrian Empire. And notice here you've got Israel and Judah. Israel is a vassal state to uh, Assyria for several decades. And uh, Judah, of course, held out only eventually to be overcome by the Babylonians. The capital city of Assyria, ancient, ancient city, even by this time, was very ancient. And by this time, I mean the time that Nahum was writing, Nineveh was an ancient city even then, is um, in, uh, right outside of Mosul, Iraq. And um, I thought I remembered this, and I, so I looked it up, and so these were one, uh, the gates one of the gates to the city of Nineveh. Now, I say were because up until 2010, they stood, but ISIS destroyed them. So you can't go now and see these. <laughs> they literally existed for thousands of years, and then uh, ISIS destroyed them like they did many uh, priceless artifacts like that. But you can see the, the grandiose nature. This is just one of the gates of the city. Okay, now, I'm, I don't normally give a trigger warning, but I think I need to this morning because we're going to talk about the Assyrians, and I'm going to be pretty graphic. I'm not going to be unnecessarily graphic about how bad the Assyrians were, okay? But it's going to be brutal. And so I understand if you're squeamish 
or if hearing about certain kinds of violence bothers you, this is, this is a, a good indication that maybe today you want to sit this one out, okay? Uh, I'm being serious. So it's okay, especially if you have a younger person in here with you and you don't think, maybe they don't need to hear this. It's okay not to, to hear it. And again, I'm not going to try to be grotesque in what I say. I just want you to see how the Assyrian army operated, how the Assyrian kings um, went about their business, okay? So this great empire of the Assyrians, we know a lot about it because there's a lot of data. There, not only do we hear about them from the Bible, we've got... Um, tons of artifacts uh, archaeological remains but then on top of that we actually have a decent number of Assyrian writings so we know about what various kings did because the kings told us what they did in their annals and I'm about to read from the annals of and I can't just say this name so uh, Asher Nasirpal the second okay this is about 100 150 years before the time of Nahum so he is one of the kings of the Assyrians. And this is how he describes um, one of his conquests, okay? I built a pillar over against the city gate and I flayed all the chiefs who had revolted and I covered the pillar with their skins. Some I impaled upon the pillar on stakes and others I bound to stakes round the pillar. I cut the limbs off the officers of the officers who had rebelled. Many captives I burned with fire and many I took as living captives. For some I cut off their noses, their ears and their fingers or many I put out their eyes. I made one pillar of the living and another of um, the heads and I bound their heads to tree trunks round their city. Their young men and maidens I consumed with fire. The rest of their warriors I consumed with thirst in the desert of the Euphrates. Okay, this is him bragging about what he did in the conquest, and I can't remember of, of which city. Okay, I just want you to see the kind of brutality. We know from the Old Testament that the city of Lachish, which is in uh, Judah, was uh, overrun by the Assyrians. And the Assyrians were really proud of that. So Sennacherib was the king at the time around 701 BC and so when Lachish fell it was such a big deal Lake which is a grandiose city that they had to commemorate it all right and one of the ways they commemorate it is in the uh, palace of Sennacherib so the palace of Sennacherib some of which still stands today has this great relief okay that is um, several feet long I don't know the exact dimensions this is it is stored in the British Museum in London okay um, lots of graphic detail on it remember we just read about what his predecessor did Sennacherib's predecessor did in flaying people by cutting their skin off while they were alive there it depicts some of that in this relief so and this is of Jews okay this is of the people of Lachish in 701 BC and there's even more graphic stuff. There's people on pikes or impaled. That was one of their favorite things. It's said that the Assyrians, as far as we know, they invented crucifixion, but first they just used a, a pike and would just put people on stakes, that kind of thing. And this was kind of the shock and awe campaign that they had. When they came, rather than just occupy a city, they would kill all the nobles and take off as many prisoners as possible and then re-inhabit the city with their own people. That was kind of the idea, or bring other peoples in. So rather than doing like the Romans or the Greeks, who typically had a, now I don't want to pretend like they weren't brutal because they were very brutal. However, what they typically do is just get the people to, to obey and then let them go about their business. And slowly but surely, more Greeks, more Romans would come into a city. But that's not how the Assyrians operated okay they were brutal in the ancient world and they were very proud of their brutality so well, I know Nick Horton taught um, about the Assyrians when he talked about the book of Jonah and the city of Nineveh and that kind of thing I don't know what detail he went into but you see that God was giving Nineveh a chance in the book of Jonah but his patience did not last forever so we know that the Assyrians eventually conquered the Israelites. So it, it recounts that in 2 Kings 17. 
So before we start to read the Nahum, I just want to want you to get a little of the of the uh, biblical background to it. So in the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, Hoshea, son of Elah, became king of Israel in Samaria, and he reigned nine years. So we got a king in Judah, a king in Israel. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, but not like the kings of Israel who preceded him. So he was bad, but he wasn't as bad as some others. Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up to attack Hoshea, who had been Shalmaneser's vassal and had paid him tribute. But the king of Assyria discovered that Hoshea was a traitor, for he had sent envoys to So, king of Egypt. And he no longer paid tribute to the king of Assyria as he had done year by year. So you see the, the um, Israelite king is paying tribute. He's a vassal state, basically, to the Assyrians. Therefore, Shalmaneser seized him and put him in prison. The king of Assyria invaded the entire land, marched against Samaria, and laid siege to it for three years. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and deported the Israelites to Assyria. He settled them in Halah and Gozan on the Haber River and the towns of the Medes. So you see here, this is when Israel falls. The northern kingdom is gone and kind of lost in the sands of time. The southern kingdom will eventually fall, but not yet. And they will be uh, ultimately the Jews that we know of today. It goes on and tells why it is that Israel fell and how they disobeyed God. But I want to pick back up in verse 24. The king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, and Sepharvaim. I'm just guessing at all these, okay? I'll be honest and settled them in the towns of Samaria to replace the Israelites. They took over Samaria and lived in its towns. So now Samaria, the capital city of what was Israel, is now inhabited by all these other people. And it goes on to say that they didn't know anything about the local God there, so they were going about worshiping, you know, didn't didn't acknowledge their local God. Then some bad stuff happened, and the king of Assyria is like, hey, wait, you gotta worship the local God there. You know, it's kind of the idea. Each local place has its own deity. And so they bring a Jewish, or excuse me, an Israelite priest to come and say, hey, who's your God? Teach us how to worship him. And so they begin to worship Yahweh there. So you have the worship of Yahweh there, but then you have the worship of these other gods. Now, this is part of what's going on by the time you get to the New Testament and you've got this division between the Jews and the Samaritans. Is that the Jews feel the Samaritans are these people who were not all from Israel but they were all from these other places and they had worshipped Yahweh but they'd worshipped these other gods too and so they're not as keen to accept them as their brothers Um, anyway there's a whole history lesson to go along with that um, that we won't get into today that gives you some background to see about um, what Nahum is saying about these brutal people whom he knows are going to um, invade and ultimately conquer Israel this is, a, this is an oracle against that nation. Okay, so Nahum chapter 1, verse 1. A prophecy concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkoshite. So, again, Nineveh is the capital city. It's the ancient city. And uh, from everything we know about it, and even from its ruins, we can tell that it was massive, that it was beautiful. So this is one artist's rendering of what some call a paradise in the Middle East. Um, So this great capital city, remember, was built off of brutality. And a great empire was built off of the deaths of thousands and thousands and thousands of conquered peoples built on slaves and so it's a very brutal uh empire that you can imagine whenever its enemies finally had a chance to rise up against it they were equally as brutal right because they saw how awful the Assyrians were now there's as we read verses two and on I want there's something that you can't get in your uh, English translation so I want to show it here and that is that there is an acrostic poem that is started but not finished starting in verse 2. So verses 2 through 8, you have an acrostic. So the, the, um, the, I should say, alphabetical poem. So it's as if, now it doesn't work exactly this way, but it's as if you start one verse with A, next verse with B, C, D, E, go down like that, okay? Now that's roughly what's happening here, but 
And so what, what this does, I got this from one of the commentaries, it shows the English translation here, and it's showing that the Hebrew letter that it starts with, okay? So the, the different part of the verse, it starts. And so you can't miss the fact that it's going A, B, C, D, E, F, G, if it were in English. You can't miss that fact, but then it just stops. And we don't know why it stops following that and then follows into something else. It could be that this was built off of an earlier poem or something like that. We don't know, all right? I just want to point that out to you. And maybe you'll find interest in this. So what the, this is the beginning of the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, He, uh, Vav, Zion, Chet, Tet, Yod, Kaf. And it stops, okay? So the, the Hebrew alphabet starts like ours, A, B, G, D, that's like Greek also starts off A, B, G, D. Anyway, we're the ones that are weird with the A, B, C, D. But it stops. Now, here's your Hebrew lesson for the day. If you got a Bible with you, open it up to. And if you don't, reach into the pew in front of you and grab a Bible. Or you can probably pull it up on your device, although I don't know if it's going to work. You need to see it in print, probably. It might work again on your phone. But So turn to Psalm 119. This is for your Hebrew lesson today, and it's straight from the Bible, so I know it's right, okay? Psalm 119, it's very clear what we're doing here, okay? You can learn the entire Hebrew alphabet from Psalm 119 because, if you'll notice, at the very top, Psalm 119, the NIV here has Aleph, and it has the Hebrew letter there, Aleph, which is like our letter A. Technically, it's a silent letter in Hebrew, but that's the first letter, Aleph. And then you have a few verses. And then the next, before verse 9, Beit, or Beth, it says here, Beit. And then a few verses down, Gimel. And then Dalet, after verse 32, He. And then before verse 41, Wal, or Vav. You can follow along and every single Hebrew letter is represented in Psalm 119. It's the longest psalm in the Bible and goes all the way to the very last letter which is before verse 169, Tav. Okay, so if you wanted to spend today during some downtime, not during my class or not during the sermon, learn some Hebrew, you can learn the whole alphabet from Psalm 119. Okay, so it's clear that this is there to, for, you know, for more than just um, practical purposes. It's got some kind of deeper meaning. Some uh, similar things going on at the beginning of Nahum, but we're not exactly sure what it is. Now, I promise not to get too much in the weeds like that again. I just want you to see it starts off and there's no way to talk about that from the translations because they don't have any way to tell you, hey, we're starting off with this, um, with uh, following the alphabet and then we stop. Okay, so I'm telling you that now. Let's read from Nahum 1. The Lord is jealous, is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm and clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and dries it up. He makes all the rivers run dry. Bashan and Carmel wither and the blossoms of Lebanon fade. The mountains quake before him and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence, the world and all who live in it. Who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. The Lord is good a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him, but with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into the realm of darkness. Whatever they plot against the Lord, he will bring to an end. Trouble will not come a second time. They will be entangled among thorns and drunk from their wine. They will be consumed like dry stubble. From you, Nineveh, has one come forth who plots evil against the Lord and devises wicked plans. So, in Nahum, you have an oracle or a prophecy against Assyria, and it's not nice, okay? So there's really strong language, and I feel like I'm saying this every week when we're talking about the minor prophets. You've got some really serious judgment going on here, and it's definitely true of uh, Nineveh here in Nahum 1. We won't dwell on all of it because I'd like to cover all three chapters, the vast majority of 
all three chapters. But just notice a few things. The book starts off by describing God as jealous, avenging, as taking vengeance and having wrath. Okay, so the picture is that God is jealous and he is angry for what the Assyrians have done to his people. Now he's upset with his people and we've read about the other prophets who've said something about that. But now it's his turn to render judgment on the Assyrians, their capital city representing their wealth, representing, uh, representing all their glamour and all their importance where all the the power of the kingdom resided Nineveh is going to come down and so he describes God as one who is over all the powers of nature so he's in the whirlwind the storm his clouds are the dust of the feet and all the commentaries mention the fact that um the uh the middle ancient middle eastern god Baal was considered the the god of the clouds and he was often pictured as riding on clouds and so when the uh, bible says that the lord is riding on a cloud it's probably in direct opposition to the idea that it's Baal instead it's the god of Israel who is the one who rides on clouds clouds are the dust of his feet it says but he rebukes seas and rivers and mountains and hills and earth the earth trembles the world and all the people in it so you see that he is all powerful and he is rendering judgment it mentions there in verse 4 that Bashan and Carmel wither so these are really fertile areas of Israel and the blossoms of leaven and fate so this is all in northern Israel um, so you know here's Galilee where Jesus is from and you can see that Mount Carmel here is right here uh, right near the Mediterranean Sea and then um, Bashan is over here. This is the area of Bashan where the Golan Heights are. If you've been to Israel, you know uh, this area. This is one um, some in the valleys there, some uh, very green and lush areas. And then up here in Lebanon where there were mountains that separated um, the two areas, there's this great beauty. And so what, what God is saying is these places that you consider fertile and beauty and, and places of strength are going to be completely decimated verse 6 talks about his indignation his anger and his wrath so God is done God is done with the Assyrians remember Jonah had come to them maybe a hundred years before and they'd repented but that repentance didn't last and so God says he's done with them but don't miss this I hope you didn't miss it there are mentions about God in his essence in these verses that I think have to be juxtaposed against the God of wrath, the God of jealousy, the God of indignation. And that is that God is, it says in verse 3, the Lord is slow to anger but great in power. Verse 7, the Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. Did you catch that? In the glimpse of all these awful things that he's about to do, it mentions the goodness of God. It mentions the fact that he's slow to anger. So it's not as if God is just going around looking for a fight, looking for people to smite. No, this is generations, hundreds of years in the making. And over and over again, he's given the people a chance to repent. So his judgment does not come willy-nilly because he looks one day and, and decides he doesn't like what people are doing. No, this is from generation after generation of sin. But he promises, look, I'm good. I don't get angry easy. I'm slow to wrath. I take care of the people who trust in me. So you do get those glimpses and those promises throughout Nahum. But it's not good for, for Assyria. So don't look for a bright point for Assyria in any way in this book, okay? It's just not going to happen. Verse 12. This is what the Lord says. Although they have allies and are numerous, they will be destroyed and pass away. Although I have afflicted you, Judah, I will afflict you no more. Now I will break your yoke from your neck and tear your shackles away. The Lord has given a command concerning you, Nineveh. You will have no descendants to bear your name. I will destroy the images and idols that are in the temple of your gods. I will prepare your grave, for you are vile. 
So again, more judgment against Nineveh and a little hope for Judah in the midst. I've, I've allowed you affliction, Judah, but I'm going to back away from that. Okay, so Judah is going to be preserved. It's clear that this was written before Judah ultimately fell um, to the Babylonians, but we'll talk about that more in a second. So this is all about the condemnation of the Assyrians in their capital city, Nineveh. And then we get to verse 15. Look. There on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news, who proclaims peace. Celebrate your festivals, Judah, and fulfill your vows. No more will the wicked invade you. They will be completely destroyed. Now, I didn't mean for all that to pop on the screen at once. Nahum has some kind of relationship to the book of Isaiah. There's so many um, uh, images that are used from Isaiah that are also used in Nahum. Um, Even some of the same wording same themes that kind of stuff and so it's clear that they're cut from the same cloth maybe one was influenced by the other but either way you can see similar kind of language about the good news that comes a verse that might be familiar to you Isaiah 52 7 how beautiful in the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news who proclaim peace who bring good tidings who proclaim salvation who say to Zion your God reigns so when we get to the New Testament and we talk about good news we're talking about the gospel And it takes, the idea of the good news takes a turn from just being good news about, hey, our invaders aren't coming anymore, to being good news for Jews and Gentiles that they can share peace together in a kingdom together. So when Paul in Romans 10 is talking about the Gentiles accepting the gospel, the good news, he says in verse 14, how then can they call on the one whom they've not believed in? And how can they believe in one of whom they have not heard and how can they hear without someone preaching to them how can anyone preach unless they are sent as it is written how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news so this theme of gospelers people bringing good news is old testament and new testament the new testament it becomes writ large because it's good news for all people so let's remember our city the great city of Nineveh some called it a paradise And this is what God says in chapter 2 is going to happen to the paradise city where people live in luxury. Okay, so now we're on to chapter 2. An attacker advances against you, Nineveh. Guard the fortress, watch the road, brace yourselves, marshal all your strength. The Lord will restore the splendor of Jacob like the splendor of Israel. Though destroyers have laid them waste and have ruined their vines, the shields of the soldiers are red. The warriors are clad in scarlet. The metal on the chariots flashes on the day they are made ready. The spears of juniper are brandished. So one of the things the Assyrians were famous for is their chariots. And again, we have lots of archaeological remains from the Assyrians and we see how they praised themselves and how they documented themselves. And so again, they're proud of their chariots and how difficult a chariot can be in battle, at least in certain kinds of battle. They're useless in other forms of battle, but it was a symbol of their great strength. And as, the, um, as their enemies heard thousands of chariots approaching, it must have sounded like a tornado. You know how, you know how they always on TVs, if they're in Tennessee or Alabama and a tornado hits and they always seem to get the, the uh, worst of our representatives to say, you know, sound like an airplane or something like that right you, the kind of fear that that it enlists and you imagine when you hear these great chariots coming now God is mocking the chariots okay chariots don't scare him he says the chariots storm through the streets rushing bath, back and forth through the squares they look like flaming torches they dart up about like lightning Nineveh summons her picked troops yet they stumble on their way they dash to the city wall the protective shield is put in place the river gates are thrown open and the palace collapses it is decreed that Nineveh be be exiled and carried away her female slaves moan like doves and beat on their breasts verse 8 Nineveh is like a pool whose water is draining away stop stop they cry but no one turns back plunder the silver plunder the gold the supply is endless the wealth from all its treasures she is pillaged plundered stripped hearts melt knees give way bodies tremble every face grows pale this is what the Assyrians did to other people and now it's uh, God says it's going to happen to you verse 11 
Where now was the lion's den, the place where they fed their young, where the lion and lioness went and the cubs with nothing to fear? The lion killed enough for his cubs and strangled the prey for his mate, filling his lairs with the kill and his dens with the prey. I am against you, declares the Lord Almighty. I will burn up your chariots in smoke and the sword will devour your young lions. I will leave you no prey on the earth. The voices of your messengers will no longer be heard. So this is clever. Because one of the um, symbols of Assyria was a lion. And so the Assyrian kings liked to depict themselves as fierce lions. So God's now talking about what's going to happen to the lions. And the Assyrian kings would actually at least depict themselves as hunting lions. You know, they're so tough that they can go out with spears and hunt lions. So again, they've told us this so you can see very brutally how proud they are to to uh, this is uh, one of the uh, kings of Assyria and he's capturing this lion you can see where they depict killing lions so they're known as the lion people okay now so what God is doing he's kind of playing off this theme and saying your lions are going to be killed your leaders he says your cubs even destroyed so the princes and the younger people the younger royalty they're not going to make it And he said in verse 5, I am against you, declares the Lord Almighty. Some translations said the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. So he's saying, my army now is against you. I will lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. I will pelt you with filth. I will treat you with contempt and make you a spectacle. All who see you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is in ruins. Who will mourn for her? Where can I find anyone to comfort you? Let's just stop here for a second. This is about justice, okay? This is about people who for many generations for hundreds of years inflicted this kind of chaos and brutality on city after city country after country so this is God judging them the Bible makes clear God has the right to do this we do not have the right to do this we don't get to decide when enough is enough as God's people to say well it's okay now to kill them all and laugh about it no 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 irony here is God did not do this with the Israelites he did not do this with the people of Judah he took down Nineveh with other kingdoms that were also brutal and pagan okay so ultimately he's saying this is the way it works in the world if you are a people of violence you will face violence that's the judgment on Assyria Jesus said, all who live by the sword will die by the sword. That's the way it works in this world. And God is saying, I've given up my patience. So even though he's slow to anger, clearly the Assyrians have reached that point. Now, in chapter 3, he mentions Thebes. So he says, are you better than Thebes situated on the Nile with water around her? This is not Thebes in Greece. This is Thebes in southern Egypt. Again, a great city. So these great columns of the ancient city that are represented here, you can still go see them today. Okay, they're represented in uh, southern Egypt. This is talking about the sack of Thebes, which took place in 663 BC. Now, One way we know things about it is because the Assyrians tell us about it. Again, they like to commemorate things. and They like to tell us how great, or what great warriors they are. And so this scene depicts much of the brutality that I've been talking about, okay? I'm not going to zoom in again because I've already done enough of that. But the whole point being, they were proud of the sack of Thebes and they wanted everybody to know about it. Uh, Historically, this again helps us date the book of Nahum because Nahum's saying, look what happened to Thebes. You think that Nineveh is any better than Thebes? So we know what the Assyrians did to Thebes. We know it happened in 663 BC. So that we know that the book of Nahum was written after that. Okay, that's one of the ways we can place it. In the 600s, after 612 BC, I should say after 663 BC, but before 612 BC. Remember, it works backwards when we're talking BC, right? 
the, the higher the number, the further away we are from now. Okay, so um, what happened to Thebes? Situated on the Nile with water around her. The river was her defense. The waters her wall. Cush and Egypt were her boundless strength. Puts and Libya were among her allies. Yet she was taken captive and went into exile. Her infants were dashed to pieces at every street corner. Remember, that's what the Assyrians did. Lots were cast for her nobles and all her great men were put in chains. You too will become drunk. You will go into hiding and seek refuge from the enemy. So, you think Nineveh's any better than Thebes? The great Thebes that you took down? That's exactly what's going to happen to you, God says. Verse 16. We're going to finish up here. And actually, I might finish up a minute or two early. You have increased the number of your merchants till they are more numerous than the stars in the sky. But like locusts, they strip the land and then fly away. Your guards are like locusts. Your officials like swarms of locusts that settle in the walls on a cold day. But when the sun appears, they fly away, and no one knows where. King of Assyria, your shepherds slumber. Your nobles lie down to rest. Your people are scattered on the mountains with no one to gather them. Nothing can heal you. Your wound is fatal. All who hear the news about you clap their hands at your fall. For who has not felt your endless cruelty? So part of the contempt that these Uh, nations that were overtaken by the Assyrians had is for those who were left you know they'd seen their uh, lands ravaged they'd seen their people taken away but some people were clearly still left in their homelands remember everybody they'd known and loved was replaced by these other people who came in the Assyrians brought in and so one of the things it says is you increase the number of your merchants So one of the ways that an empire worked is after it conquered new territory, that expanded um, its influence. And obviously business people are going to want a chance to come in and reap the rewards of that. And so you conquer a big city like Lakish, you bring in a lot of new people, and money's going to follow it, right? Because there's going to be merchants that show up selling things, buying things, trading things, arranging things. But here's the the idea. They're not going to try to make the city wealthy they're going to take the wealth back to their people look at what the british empire did throughout the world right i mean they whenever they conquered a place they immediately british people came there and began to profit off of their oil or their spices or anything like that that's the way empires work right they bring in their own people and what do those people do invariably they send that money back don't they And that's what this is saying about the Assyrians. You increase the number of your merchants, they're like locusts. They strip the land and they fly away. So not only do you conquer us, then you come and you slowly peel away all of our resources. Take them back for yourselves. That's another way. They're like locusts, another form of God's judgment. And so God, uh, Nahum slash God, ends this um, book with a message to the king of Assyria. So this is the end of Nahum. Again, it doesn't end on some cheery note that I can tell you about. It's just a message to the king of Assyria. Look, your people aren't ready. There's nothing you can do. The wound is fatal, he says. And all of the surrounding nations, when they hear about it, they're going to applaud it because you know who you are. And so the way it ends, I think, is appropriate to kind of put a, a nail in the coffin of the Assyrians, and that is... Who has not felt your endless cruelty? So that's the way Assyria is to be known in the history books. It was great. It was mighty. It was rich. It was all those things. But it was brutal. And so God's final word on Assyria is judgment because, he says, of your endless cruelty. That's why I don't feel bad starting this class off with a graphic description of the way the Assyrians were. That's how they were and. God said he would not let it last forever. But remember how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Let's be good news bringers today. Thanks so much for your attention. You're dismissed.